In today's video, I'll be showing you how to calculate the components for the boost converter and the inverting converter, and then doing the schematic capture on KiCad. I will show you a list of building materials that I have for this part. So obviously on screen now, you've got the boost converter, which will produce 24 volts DC for us. And this is the minus 12 volt inverting converter, which I've changed the feedback network right at the end of the video to produce a minus 24 volts DC. So let's get started. So let's now calculate the components that we'll need for the boost converter and the inverting converter. So on page 13 is where the boost converter calculations start on the datasheet. So I'll be just going through them step by step and filling out all the details I need. So obviously we know our input voltage is 5 volts. I'm trying to get 24 volts out from the output and the maximum current capability of this part is approximately 820 milliamps when the input voltage is 5 volts. So um, this is what I'm going to aim for. So first of all, let's calculate the maximum duty cycle, which we can see over here. So V out minus V in divided by V out. Obviously, um, I'm going to be using a 5 volt power supply, so there's not going to be a massive range on this. So this shouldn't change that much. So I'm just going to use my nominal 5 volts output. So the maximum duty cycle is going to be 0 0.79. The maximum average current through the inductor is given by equation 10 over here. IO in this case is the output current, which we have set as 82 milliamps. And that is multiplied by 1 divided by 1 minus the maximum duty cycle. And then all of that is multiplied by 1 divided by the efficiency. So you can see I've not got efficiency on this chart yet. So I'll just add that over here. So let's look for the efficiency figures that's given to us in the data sheet. So over here, you can see the efficiency on this line here. And at a load current of approximately 800 milliamps, you have the efficiency as 85% really. Um, so that's what I'm going to put down. So the maximum average inductor current is 4.63 amps for this application. The data sheet then goes on to give you a calculation for the maximum output you should aim for due to the internal limits of the switching. And that equation is given on equation number 11 over here. So I'll do that calculation, but I don't think it's that necessary for us, but it might highlight some issues. So the maximum output current is V in divided by V out multiplied by 5 minus 0 0.5 multiplied by the inductor ripple current, which we haven't calculated yet. And then all of that is multiplied by the efficiency, which we have as 85%. So I'm just going to make a new cell with the switching current. But from the data sheet, we do have a recommended uh, switching current of 1.85 amps. So that's what I'm going to start with. So you can see now the calculated maximum output current for this uh, circuit is now 0 0.72 amps rather than the 0 0.82 amps that we um, originally wanted. And this is due to the inductor ripple current that we set as 1.85 amps as recommended by the data sheet. Now you can read this section here which gives you the kind of the compromises that you go through when selecting this uh, ripple current. But essentially choosing a smaller value inductor ripple current increases the output current capability. So we can reduce this to increase the maximum current that we get here. But it means that we'll need a larger inductor and it will reduce the current loop gain. Having a larger inductor ripple current means that we can use a smaller inductor and it provides fast transient responses. There are some other limitations, but you can go through the data sheet in more detail if you need to. But for this application, I'm just going to stick with the recommended value of 1.85 amps. Next, we can go on to the calculation for the inductance that we require. And that is given to us on equation 12. So the inductor value is equal to V in divided by the inductor ripple current multiplied by the oscillation frequency. And all of that is multiplied by the maximum duty cycle. So obviously we haven't come across the F oscillations before. The frequency value can be selected by us by setting a RT resistor, which you can see on page 10 of the data sheet. So setting the RT resistor as 165 kilo ohms, you have a switching frequency of 300 kilohertz. And if you set the RT resistor to 20 kilo ohms, 
you can set the switching frequency of the boost converter to 2 megahertz. So I'm going to go with the highest frequency because this usually results in a lower inductor size. So I have set the switching frequency to 2 megahertz and that gives me an inductor value of 1.1 microhenries. And in the following section, it tells you what you should aim for the peak inductor current and the RMS inductor current values. The data sheet recommends that we choose an inductor with the peak current rating of 7.8 amps. So I'm going to move the frequency down a little bit so I can keep all the values for the inductor together. So the peak current is 7.8 amps and the RMS inductor current is equal to the IL max we calculated on equation 10, which is 4.63 amps. When choosing an inductor, you want to make sure that you have minimum DCR value as this will reduce the I squared R losses. There is a different calculation when your duty cycles are above 50% and your operation mode is on CCM. So equation 13 gives you the minimum inductance value for this scenario. So we can see the inductor value that's given to us on this calculation is smaller than the inductor value that we calculated before. Therefore, I think we are okay with to continue with this uh, inductor value that we've calculated here, as what this paragraph is saying is that it will prevent um, oscillations as long as we have an inductor value that's above this when we are operating above 50% duty cycle. Input capacitor selection is generally the easiest part of this designing a boost converter. And in the data sheet, they will just give you a recommended value that you should use. And sometimes they may give you what the cost benefits are of going lower or higher. So the recommendations on this are that we use a X7R or X5R dielectric capacitor, and it should be pl placed as close as possible to the V-in and the ground pin. We shouldn't use Y5 V type capacitors as they have poor performance over the temperature and the applied voltage range. So the recommended value over here is 4.7 microfarads to 10 microfarads. However, there is a caveat. If your power signal has high impedance, let's say like a nine volt battery, which would typically have a high parasitic series resistance, then you may need additional capacitors to compensate for that. I'm going to set the requirement for voltage rating for this capacitor as 10 volts minimum. Generally, when you operate capacitors, the input voltage on this is 5 volts. But if you choose a capacitor that's let's say 6.3 volts, then the capacitance value generally drops. So to avoid that, I'm just going to make sure that I have a higher voltage rated capacitor. There can be a few more considerations for the output capacitor. But as you can see on this data sheet, they've given us what we should aim for in terms of the value of the capacitance and the trade-offs. So they have given us a range from 4.7 microfarads to 47 microfarads. What I'm going to do is just use the recommended circuit from the beginning. Generally, you can use lower value capacitors if your current draw is going to be lower as well. One important thing that the data sheet talks about is using ceramic capacitors in this application might not be suitable because of um, burst mode operation. So when we are using this regulator we are likely going to operate it in burst mode which means that the f switching frequency uh, depends on the load current and at very light loads the LT8334 may induce the capacitors to produce audible noise however uh, for this application I'm not too concerned with that so I'm just going to use uh, ceramic capacitors but alternatives for that would be to use high performance tantalum capacitors or electrolytic capacitors Another component that we need to select for this is the diode. Diodes generally in boost converter applications need to be fast switching and have a low voltage drop across them. So almost always the recommended diode to use is the shock key diode, which has both of those characteristics. Now you can see from here, they have not given us any calculations for power dissipation or current through the diode but they have given us reverse voltage and average forward current specifications for four different part numbers. So what we're going to do is just take one of these diodes as an example and find similar from the company that I'm sourcing my components from. And that should be everything in the design done except for R1 and R2, which I'm just going to use from the reference design.
So what I'm going to do now is select the components that I need with the parameters that I've decided over here from the design calculations of the boost converter. Obviously the schematic is going to look like that, so I'll quickly draw that after doing my bill of materials. And then I will um, basically do the same thing for the inverting converter as well, where I will be aiming for minus 24 volts output. That design is a little bit different, but I will show you the steps on how to do that as well. So on the screen now, you can see the bill of materials that I have for the boost converter. I will populate the reference designators after I have done the schematic. So you can see my existing schematic is on display right now. I am just going to add in the boost converter, which I'm going to power from the VBUS rail. So I will add it after this port. And the first thing I need is input capacitors. Next, let me check if the LT8334 port is available on KiCad. So it appears that that part is not available. So I'll make that at the end, but I will add in everything else that I need. I also need the feedback resistor network, which is just two resistors in series. And that goes after the shock key diode. And the bottom resistor is connected to ground. Finally, there are four components that I need to connect for the timing, um, soft start and the VC pin. So now that I've done this, let me show you how to create the component in KiCad. So first of all, what you need to do is go to this page here and go to symbol editor. And I'll just check if I've got a library that I'm already making. If I have, then I'll comp create the component into that library. So you can see I've got a, my library here for this project that I created earlier. And in there, I'm going to create a new symbol. And the symbol name is going to be LT8334. All of these designators are fine and then I will need to basically add in all the pins that I see on my symbol and essentially what I'm recreating is basically this diagram over here you can see now that I've got all the pins over here from the diagram that I showed you just make sure that it's aligned and add in finally a box So now you can see I have created my symbol and I've got one pin over here that's obviously not on the symbol that I showed you and also there are two pins for the switching node. Obviously the schematic on the datasheet simplified that part to not show everything. I think it's best to just show everything on the symbol itself rather than hiding bits which can make it a little bit different on the PCB design. So now going back to my schematic editor, I will go to here and I should be able to search for that part. So LT8334, you can see that the part is now available and I can basically connect it up between these two places here. I know that I need to connect my ground to this node. I'm going to move some of these out the way slightly so that they're easier to follow. I think the symbol can be a little bit bigger and I might tidy that up later, but for now, I'm just going to leave it as is. Finally, add in my last component for this part, which is a one microfarad capacitor. And the bias pin is connected to ground. 
Now you can see I've got two more connections to make, which are around this node here. And I'm going to do that by simply just taking these connections here. These two points I know connect together. And that's the switching node. So you obviously got two tracks for that. That's fine. And now you can see I have got the schematic fully um, completed. And we can move on to the footprint assignment tool. You can see I've now done the footprint assignment tool for this um, new components that I've had here. So, you know, the diode is SOD123. The LT8334 package is a DFN 12 pin with a, a ground pad underneath. And then obviously the resistors are just 0402. And the capacitors we're using are going to be um, 10 microfarads. Um, and I'll need to get them from a different source, but I will see. Um, I'll get them pre-fitted with the 22 microfarad because that's the co component that's available from where I'm going to source this board from. I might replace them afterwards, um, just manually solder some other components in. So let me just change these values to 22 microfarads. So this is basically the circuit that will create 24 volts DC for us from the 5 volts that we get from the USB-C connector over here. This will also need to connect to the battery, which is connected on this pin. But what I will do is add a switch on this so that I can switch between the battery and the USB-C connector. Next, I will do the same calculations for the inverting connector um, because I want to try and get minus 24 volts out of this as well. So that will give me the capability of having plus and minus 24 volts DC with the current capability of 800 milliamps. Obviously that might not be possible from a USB-C connector point of view, but I do have a 65 watt USB-C port that I can use. So we'll see how that goes, but I think it'll be all right. So now let's quickly draw the schematic for the inverting output of the 24 volts DC. Now I've not done the calculations for this yet, but we can do that eventually as I will be following the reference design anyway. The reference design for the inverting connector is shown on the screen now. So I'm using the same part, LT8334. However, you can see there are two inductors on this board. They are a coupled inductor, so hopefully I get those parts available. If not, I'll have to source something else. Um, obviously, we've got a part number from here, which I want to try and use to kind of simplify and reduce the time I need to search for a new part. Um, the diode is connected slightly differently. As you can see, it's going to ground now from the switching node with a, with a capacitor that's in series over here. So let me just draw this circuit and we'll do the component calculations afterwards. However, I think the components that we have at the moment are going to be okay for what we're doing um, because you can see that the feedback network is the same. Obviously, you have an extra capacitor over here for filtering and uh, feedback loop compensation. You can also see the input and output capacitors are 22 microfarads. And in this case, we need three of them. Um, and on the input, we just have one. Obviously, I've already got 22 microfarad capacitors that I have in the bill of materials, but they are not rated to 24 volts or 12 volts. So I'll need to find some new ones um, just to make sure that the voltage rating on the capacitors are sufficient. So I don't imagine any problems with the components that I already have. And if I'm able to get this Eton inductor, then I don't need to do any of the calculations for similar to what we did for the boost converter. Eventually, I will make a video for how this converter works. But at the moment, um, let's just copy this circuit. So this is the inductor that we need. And you can see that it's one, two, three, and four. So one and three are together on inductor one and two and four are together on inductor two. It would be nice to get that as a separate part, but I don't think there is one. I'm not going to create one just for this. But essentially what I'm doing is copying this circuit at the moment, which is the recommended um, typical application circuit for this part.
what I just realized after doing that schematic is I didn't read this properly. So what I'll do now is just make sure that this regulator can do minus 24 volts and what components I need to be able to achieve minus 24 volts. Because I saw the same value components as the 24 volt boost converter, I assumed it was minus 24 volts. However, um, that is basically the schematic done. This is as neat as I could make this coupled inductor over here. So that matches everything that I need to do. I just need to put in this capacitor for filtering on the top of my feedback network. So I've just fixed my schematic with the new capacitor as well. And let me go and check with how I can get minus 24 volts DC. If I can't, um, I'll just stick with the minus 12 for now and then we'll go from there. So I've worked out why this combination of the feedback resistor, 1 mega ohm and 71.5k, produces minus 12 volts rather than minus 24 volts as it did with plus 24 volts with the other configuration. That's because for reverse voltages, the feedback voltage is 0 0.8 volts rather than 1.6, which is the case here. So in order to achieve 20 minus 24 volts, we basically need to change this resistor value to 34,000 ohms. And with that resistor combination, we should get a negative voltage of approximately 24.3 volts in the reverse direction. It doesn't say on the data sheet that we can't achieve minus 24 volts DC, but I'm not 100% sure if this will work. If it doesn't work, we can change this resistor and just get a lower voltage on the output. So this is all I'm going to cover in today's video, because obviously this video is going to be long enough. And in the next video, I will do the PCB design for these two converters. Thank you for watching today. And if you have any questions, please let me know in the comment section below.